Welcome to video highlights of the News Geezers Lunch held on Saturday, July 30th, 2016 at Victorio's in North Hollywood. I'm Bob Tarlow. This is one of our regular quarterly lunches. I decided to break this video into two parts because of the length of the program that day. The first part, the one you're watching now, deals with the D.B. Cooper hijack investigation. The second part features Frank Snap, a longtime KNBC writer and producer who was terminated there at age 69. He took age discrimination action against NBC, and you'll hear how that turned out. But first, back to D.B. Cooper and the investigative work of Tom Colbert and his co-author Tom Salazie, plus Tom's extensive cold case team. Their book, The Last Master Outlaw, available on Amazon, is a compelling story, telling the reason they are so sure they know who D.B. Cooper really is. Here's that part of the program. This is obviously a controversial subject. Tom, both Toms are very, very willing to take any questions you may have on this subject, and I'm sure there's some good ones in this room. Uh, I had some when I watched the History Channel program, and I'm looking forward to reading their book. Both Toms, Colbert and Solacy, please come forward. Give them a big hand. So what's new, everybody? It's so wonderful to be in front of my mentors and friends and trainers and babysitters as I move through the news business in the 1980s. Um, it's, just, it's just wonderful. I consider myself in front of family today. So thank you for having us. Um, I want to ask a quick question. Do you want to see, hear the public version of the story or the off-the-record version of the story? What do you know? They must be news people. All right. If you want any of it on the record, we can talk about that later. Uh, but I think you'll have more fun with the off the record. First of all, we have absolutely found Bigfoot. I'm just checking to make sure they're awake. I had a tip in 2011 from a 20-year cameraman in Vegas, a very close friend named Rich Kashansky. He always tips me two or three times a year, uh, two or three times a year, and um, since leaving the news business, I still make true stories. Uh, this is my 20th true story for the bigger small screen, which I'm very proud of. But Rich called in 2011, and he has a little grapevine in the casinos. And there's a man in the casinos claiming he has something he wants to get off his chest. And he sits the man down in front of a camera. He sends me the footage. And here is a former drug runner from Portland claiming that he witnessed the planning of the planting of the $5,800 of Cooper money along the Columbia River. Now, I can tell you from law enforcement friends for years, Nobody ever believed the family just found it there seven years later, still with rubber bands on it, okay? Trust me. And we were always watching for that. And I, at KCBS, as the senior researcher, I'd get calls all the time from people that had Cooper theories. It was my husband on his deathbed. It was my aunt. Uh, it, was, it was this and that. But what made this interesting was it hit a nerve to law enforcement friends. And I realized this was worth investigating. So. I worked with this former drug runner, Ron Carlson. Uh, he went through a lie detector test through a former FBI member, passed. And he proceeded to tell us he was, uh, for the last year of his drug trade in 1979, his cocaine trafficker at a party one day overlooking the river said, I know you don't believe I'm Cooper because he was short, uh, different face, party boy, not very sophisticated. But he had the Vietnam stories, he had the uh, training uh, moments of the jump, what happened. It's a fascinating year for him, but he never bought the story. And then at the party, he says, I'm going to prove it to you now. He points out the window on the north shore of the Columbia, and you see, says, you see that north shore? You see that couple at the party? And this is a cocaine party going on. And there is the couple. Uh, what was the last name again? No, no. We'll think of it. But anyway, they, he called them the hippie couple. The hippie couple was there and said, 
that couple is going to find some of my money on the North Shore in five days. And my runner said, uh, yeah, sure, boss. And so he got his partner. They made another run to Phoenix. And on the way to Phoenix, they stopped in Reno. And four days later, they're turning on the tube at night, and they're watching TV. And there is uh, Brian and his parents, uh, the little boy, eight years old, and his parents on TV explaining how they found the money on the North Shore. Well, he referred me to one or two other drug traffickers. Keyword is drug traffickers. And they all had the same story, but they hadn't talked to each other, we verified, in 25 years. They all had different variations of this story. So I decided it's worth investigating. So I spent the next eight months believing this trafficker could be D.B. Cooper because of the money, even though he didn't look like it. So I started calling grammar school friends, high school friends, frat brothers. And the common thread was, he's a party boy. He's not sophisticated. He couldn't have done this. He's always high, driving around in his Bentley, <laughs> being chauffeured around. Uh, couldn't be him. And so at about the eighth month, I finally called the last friend on the list. This was a bartender who happened to be a, a big high school basketball star in the Northwest and in college. And I, I called him last because he was a bartender. Let's face it, a lot of bartenders are on both sides of the law sometimes. And besides, he had the first name of Pudgy. <laughs> and I've seen too many movies where sawed off shotguns are pulled out from behind bars by a guy named Pudgy. And, but he turned out to be like, kind of like Bill Stout, tough but a pussycat. You got to talk to him. And I brought up his drug dealer friend's name. They were frat brothers. And he made my shoulders sink because it, he wasn't Cooper. He was sitting in my bar when that happened. Ingram. The Ingram family. Thank you. Um, he said he couldn't have been Cooper. He was here, drunk. But you know, I introduced him to a guy in 1973 when we put the floor down at the basketball gym at Pepperdine University in Malibu. He was the foreman, and they became crime partners for seven years. And I'm thinking, thank you, Jesus. We found a partner with the skill sets. And we confirmed that partner, and we dug up article after article in archives. And we're talking folks before Microfish Archives, 1971. And some saint in, in, in Stockton, California, where this former veteran, Bob Rackstraw, was in all sorts of trouble, check kiting, fraud, stealing a plane, hoarding 150 pounds of explosives, uh, facing all sorts of charges. This guy was uh, in court three or four times. He even killed his own stepdad. And I say killed, even though he's found not guilty, a la OJ, folks. Uh, an amazing story. His sister later realized he did. Uh, his crime partners who I tracked down said, we all know Bob killed him. He got off. He's that shrewd. This guy was involved in all sorts of crimes. Now, without microfish, without any newspapers from the 70s at the Stockton Record, there was some saint 35 years ago who filled a paper bag with clippings on all his trials. We had 51 articles of his trials, his quotes. And there has just been miracle after miracle on this story. There was one episode where there are two people in this room that are involved in the story. And it started with a call to one of my former mentors, Don Ray. And I called Don Ray because we wanted the military background on this man. I mentioned his name, Bob Rackstraw. And he says, I know Bob Rackstraw. He called us in 1979. He claimed to be Cooper. <laughs> and I, again, I'm looking up thinking, I got to become a priest. This is getting ridiculous. All the favors I owe. And Don did not only background for me, he told me that good old P Pete Noyes, uh, he had called Pete Noyes trying to, the, motives, uh, the motive is hard to understand, but he, in essence, wanted to switch from state prison to federal prison, and he thought he could get the Fed sort of interested so they'd give him a club Fed. That was his mind think. So he called and said, I'm D.B. Cooper, and of course, Pete Noyes took the call. 
And he said two words, prove it. <laughs> and that's when he said, well, I'm kind of in jail here in Stockton, but I'll tell you why I use the name Cooper. I have an uncle named Ed Cooper, and he's jumped over 2,000 times in Phoenix. And if you track him down, he'll verify that. Don Ray's the one that found Ed Cooper in 1979, I find out. He was a rookie researcher at the time, back from Vietnam, and he tracked Ed Cooper down, who not only admitted it was his nephew, but when he told him it was about claiming to be Cooper, he just said, I don't know anything about that. And you could tell the family has different feelings about Bob Rackstraw. Bottom line is, there are an incredible group of facts that popped up. And by the way, one of the reporters who interviewed Mr. Bob Rackstraw, who we believe to be D. Cooper, is Doug Kriegel right over there. And we have 37, 38-year-old tape that we found, the only footage of R.D.B. Cooper at prime time in the 70s. And that footage has been essential with eyewitnesses in the North, where our man hid for five months under an AKA, one of his 21 aliases he's used in his life. And he was there while he was scoping out the jump. We have 12 witnesses who have all looked at Doug Kriegel's footage and said that's the way he looked down, that's the way he talked, that's the man. So I don't want to spend the whole time telling a story because I want you to buy the book. <laughs> I would suggest that you buy this book. And the reason is this. This is the investigative report that we built with our cold case team. You should know that we have a 40 member cold case team still with us. 23 of them are former feds, 12 of them FBI. Now the, the feds have never been involved in a thousand suspects. This is the first time. That should tell you how serious this is. They have found with us 101 pieces of evidence including, for, including forensics and DNA on this guy. That's the report that we made for the FBI. Now, the off the record part of this, you saw that some, how many people saw the documentary? I'm so happy it's low. <laughs> it was well put together. We worked with them, we turned over the investigative report. They approached the FBI six months before broadcast and said, we'd like you to be, participate in the program. They decided to make the two hour program a four hour program to bring in young people for the first time to watch history. <laughs> and so they decided to do 10 suspects. Uh, all of the others are dead and cleared. Our guy is alive and cleared. Our guy was arrested and released in 79. Um, this has everything in it, 100 pieces of some odd evidence. That's been translated for the book, 47 pages of endnotes in this. Writing it was a pleasure, work but pleasure. Footnotes was five weeks of hell. <laughs> but because he's still out there, the good news is we got insurance like that. The good news is Mr. Rackstraw has been threatening to sue us for close to three years, no suits. And I'm happy to say, thanks to my mentors and friends here, I haven't been sued once in 35 years. I'm meticulous to the point of my wife's annoyance, as she knows. And I'm very happy we made this book the Bible. And he can't do a damn thing, frankly, because the facts are backed up multiple ways, and that's why I think you'll appreciate this book. The sad part on the documentary, they left out about 18 of our key pieces of evidence. They decided to keep out the DNA and the forensics. It's like, don't think the audience can go that level? What's the, what's the problem? Bottom line is you get the truth in the book. The FBI has been waiting for us for three to four years to bring in the case. We met with them in 2012 with 33 pieces of evidence about the money on the river. They felt it wasn't enough, but they encouraged us to move ahead with the doc. And if, like America's Most Wanted, if you get suspects and information, have people call us. And that's when my wife and I decided, do we really want to do another mystery? Or do we want to hire our own police department? And we did. And these 40 members, God bless them, they're brothers and sisters, they've brought the proof in my view. Well, the FBI, knowing this case was coming, and after looking at 33 pieces of evidence, made a gamble. They said, okay, let's say Colbert's doubled it, 60. It's forensic. It's 40 years, 45 years later. 
The witnesses are all going to be old. The DNA is going to be corrupted. We can't do this. We're going to lose the case. And besides, half the jury is going to probably think he's Jesse James, a hero, rather than a criminal. So they made the gamble of closing the case at the end of this documentary. Now, we have known that for half a year it was coming. Our team naively thought, yeah, we'll help you close it. We'll bring in our case. We were promised for five months that we would be able to meet with the FBI and present our case. They canceled the meeting. And you can imagine how livid my team is. And on August 16th, I will be standing with one of my three attorneys in front of federal court in Washington, and we are suing the Department of Justice to get the records on Mr. Robert Rackstraw. Thank you. I am driven by truth, and um, my wife's driven by uh, truth, and we just feel that uh, this is why we're here, folks, to tell the truth, as all of us have done in our lives. I will tell you, we haven't had one person who's looked at the book saying we're wrong. Two-thirds of them that have read the book have said, it's him. Except and Bob Rackstraw. Except Bob Rackstraw. <laughs> Bob bought a book. He bought a book. We verified it on Amazon. And of course, he said, oh, it's all, I can't say it. My star. wife's here. He gave, he gave us one star. <laughs> <laughs> but all the rest are five, so it balances out. But I think you, I think, and again, I'm not complimenting myself. I'm complimenting our cold case team because this is their hard blood sweat. And all nine tenths of them volunteered. You know, only, we only had to hire armed guards. <laughs> you know, and certain forensic people, but it was these were all volunteers, and that's why I think you're going to appreciate the book. Um, I have two questions. One is, is there a statute of limitations on prosecuting him? And the other is, do you have any evidence that he actually got money and how much? It was five years. On the last evening of that fifth year, uh, Hemmelsbach, the agent in charge in Portland, got a federal grand jury to sit down and declare a John Doe indictment. If, if those of you don't know what that is, that is in essence when we find a John Doe who could be Cooper, well then the five years kicks back in. The Supreme Court has thrown half of those out. Half of them have stuck. It's a pretty big gamble for the uh, Department of Justice to rely on that. I think that's one reason they don't want this case to happen is because I, I, I personally, I think it's gonna be a negotiation. I don't see this guy getting more than two to three years, 20 years probation, and then he'll never have to buy a beer again. That's what I think is going to I mean, he's 72. Um, we ambushed him with camera. Jim Forbes ambushed him with our cameras in uh, May of 2013. In September 13 was his first, if you call me Cooper, I'll sue you. Uh, in November of 2013, he had a stroke and a heart attack. He's on a pacemaker now. Um, and so I really don't think they're going to throw this guy in prison for 50 years, 20 years. I think it'll be two to three and probation. But what am I? I'm not an attorney. Second part of the question was? Did he get money? We believe he did. Remember I said that the drug trafficker he exchanged money with first in 74? We have a drug middleman, his accountant who is now 72 with a bad back and has had his come to Jesus moment. And he told us he was in his home when the drug trafficker is doing lines of coke on his mom's table with Mr. Robert Rackstraw. And he looked below the table, and this, there's a duffel bag of money. Now, this was about two years after the jump. When I heard that from Mr. Jim Shell, I said, Mr. Shell, was this trafficker dealing with Krugerrands, which at the time was the money exchange for the bad guys? And he said, oh yeah, he wore a couple around his neck. Well, during our research for the next six months, we found two people that witnessed him exchanging Krugerrands on in transactions, one for 60,000 bail, and the other, I'm not sure what the money exchange was, but. We personally believe he bought a 12-acre estate in Southern California with it, lived there for 15 years. That is now a condo in San Diego where he now lives with his third ex-wife and has a boat in the harbor. And you can find him at his uh, yacht club. And the name of the boat? Poverty Sucks. 
I'm not making this up. I am not making this up. You can punch it up online. Poverty sucks. <laughs> this was such a different era back then. Uh, I'm kind of two part question. One, why has he never claimed credit for it? And two, if this were to happen today with social media, do you think he would claim credit for it? No, he couldn't survive it today. And this was the last, you remember the great movie, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kids? Who are those guys? Private security changed the Old West, right? Bonnie and Clyde, one of the last uh, you know, outlaws that could just run town to town. That was before the FBI, and then the FBI came on, and with logistics and research, they were able to track those folks. Mr. Bob Rackstraw was the last man before DNA, CSI, crime databases, uh, coordination between departments, long-range radio, everything. And he took advantage of that. And that's, he's one of the last outlaws that has not been identified. You can't be unidentified anymore. It doesn't happen. That went away with rotary phones. <laughs> and the second, the second question was? Um, do you think somebody today would, would really actually take credit for it, given the popularity you might get on social media? I, again, I, I think it'd be hard to take credit because, I mean, even your voice can be tracked now. Your cell phones, your, your, your expenses, this was all before that. So you could speak anonymously and pass it down, you know, a, you know, fire, by fire pit, by fire pit, it would get around the West. This is how he lived. Um, and he is a narcissist, narcissistic sociopath. And one of the questions our psychologist said, well, where did he go after 1980? He served one year. He got three college degrees, including a law license. And where does a sociopath go? He became a professor. <laughs> he, be he became, no, yeah, no offense, <laughs> professor. He became a uh, arbitration expert at UC Riverside. He became head of the department for two of the 10 years. Then he reached semi-retired, bought a boat shop, and now he lives in San Diego. So that's where a sociopath goes sometimes. Sometimes, I left you opening. <laughs> it's still a hell of a crime. And in fact, now I would think it's an even, you know, it's, it's treated even more harshly than it would be then. So no, I think he'd be as quiet as a mouse. And this way he's allowed to, you know, swagger around and act like he's hot stuff. And, and only because that last little link hasn't really locked in yet. I think that's one of the main differences. Thanks, Tom. Sure. People Magazine says that one of the problems is that the flight attendant who spent a lot of time with him on the flight in 1971, says that Rackstraw doesn't resemble that guy in I'm glad any way. You br I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. That is one of the two pieces of evidence that the FBI presented in the documentary on why our guy couldn't be him. You're about to hear what we discovered. I, look, I'm not criticizing Tina. Tina was the blonde stewardess that sat next to him four to five hours on the, on the flight. Um, I'm not criticizing her at all. Uh, Tina is a member of the FBI family. Uh, her, his, her sister is married to a 35-year agent who just passed away recently. So they've protected her all these years. She hasn't spoken since the news conference in Reno. Everyone wanted to hear what Tina had to say. So that footage of sitting her down, first of all, the FBI took five pictures, eight by tens of our guy and laid them out and said, do you know this guy? That would never stand up in court. We did, someone else on the plane, a college student, and I brought in a detective sergeant who did a six pack, and it's just like a lineup, folks. They take six pictures of similar bad guys and they point. Our guy who sat in the same row as Cooper watched him. He's the man that caused the second sketch. Uh, this sketch is from John Mitchell, a college student. Now, the reason this is a credible sketch, the passengers were never told it was a hijack. They were told it was engine problems, so they had no trauma. The three stewardesses, I tracked them all down, are victims of major trauma, mostly Tina. And this is not known very much, but five years ago, two, two FBI agents did an article. They had interviewed her in the 80s separately, years apart, said she had little to no memory of the hijacking at all. 
said she would never be able to testify in court. Now, no offense, I don't trust the media alone. I had to buy their books. I bought both their books to check. And not only did they mimic that statement, it was the closing statement of a former agent in charge of, of Salt Lake City who said, uh, even though she promised to look at pictures and sketches, talking to her, I realized that would not be necessary. So this devastated our team when they heard this, because they're saying, why would the FBI stick this poor woman in front of cameras to judge our man's picture if she has extreme memory loss from the jump? All three of them do. I tracked all three down. Each one of them ha cannot remember what they said. One, God bless her, thinks she was the only one sitting next to him and it wasn't Tina. Said I was the only one back there. So trauma has affected the stewardesses, but not Bill Mitchell, who, as I said, looked at the six pictures right to our guy, right to him. And that's one of our 101 pieces of evidence that the FBI won't even look at, which is very, very sad. About the DNA that you mentioned, uh, he was on that plane for quite some time. Was there anything collected off of any of the doorknobs, any of the uh, cups, or uh, anything he might have eaten on board uh, at the time, even though DNA wasn't discovered you know, for forensic use until the mid-'80s? And if not, what was the DNA that the FBI does not want to talk about? Good question. There were 77 plastic cups connected, uh, collected, and this is confirmed from recent discussions with the FBI. There was a cup at the seat where he was. According to one agent, though, the only fingerprints found on it were the two stewardesses. There was railways on that stairway when he left. And everybody said, well, there must be prints on the railway. Every one of the prints on the railway were smeared all the way up and down. We're talking about a very, very sophisticated crook. There were four letters mailed right after the jump. I'm D.B. Cooper, you can't find me. They were collected by the agents and a police department in Vancouver, which received one of them. Those letters, not one print on them. He knew all about fingerprints. He did not know about DNA. I will tell you that one of his 21 identities during the research, because he's a recon guy with first calf, chopper pilot, paratrooper, trained by CIA, CIA in Vietnam, trained by special forces. I mean, this guy's off the scales. He's almost like a gump. He was such a hot pilot, he had over 50 medals. Two of them, uh, distinguished flying crosses, silver cross, bronze cross. He was a go to hell guy. And he became the co-pilot of the general that led the, the Cambodia incursion, sitting right next to the general. We tracked the general who's in his 90s in Texas. We didn't tell him he's Cooper, but we did tell him he had a bunch of felonies. And I'll, I'll never forget the man's words. He just said, I can't believe I trusted that man with my life. It's fascinating for, coming from a general. I'm, I just don't have the gut to tell him he's Cooper. But bottom line is, he sent letters when he was up north. His identity was Norman de Winter from Switzerland. He was visiting America to walk with the people. He sent letters, he gave gifts, he, he borrowed thousands of dollars. We have 12 witnesses in two towns, Astoria Corvallis, that have identified him through Warren's, no, uh, through Doug's video and, and Warren Olney's video, looking at him, have said that's Norman. That's his voice, the way he looks down, it's fascinating. Well, we found some letters from some of these witnesses where they were writing back and forth. Most of them kept them. We, we, it stumped us. They kept the gifts, the necklaces given to a gal. She still has the necklace. He was a charmer. He was a ladies' man. Stick them stamp, old-fashioned stamp on one of those letters. We took it to a lab that works with the FBI. We also confronted him in San Diego where his Poverty Sucks boat is. We confronted him at his boat shop and a water bottle and the first day, which was not on camera, it was on surveillance, but not on camera, um, a water bottle fell and we grabbed it. There are three alleles on that stamp that match three alleles on the bottle. Now the bottle is mixed because Jim Forbes threw it to me, I put it in the car, but we know who the other two guys are. And our FBI guys looked at this and said, 
this is actionable, and this would cause a judge to get a swab. You could get a swab order. Again, the FBI hasn't even heard this. They won't look at the case because it's circumstantial. 60% of cases are circumstantial, folks. They can't eliminate circumstance. They just caught a murderer up in, I think it's Minnesota, 45 years. He killed a little girl. He bragged about it in San Francisco. That doesn't have 101 pieces of evidence. It goes on and on. Tom, I might as well look into that camera and say, how are you doing, Mr. Rackstraw? Because this will be posted on the website, which is, we learned today, is seen around the world. There's no question it'll find its way, or a link will find its way to Mr. Rackstraw and his attorneys. How come, you, how come you're doing this? Or do you want, to, you want that to happen? No, we absolutely want that to happen. The bottom line is he's been threatening us for three years. Do you have, folks find it curious an innocent man hasn't sued in three years? Makes everybody else wonder. He is threatening uh, to sue even now. He's on the blogs. He went on uh, uh, themountainnews.com. If you folks don't know that wonderful little paper, themountainnews.com, Washington State. They're the place for the best article histories on D.B. Cooper. Bruce Smith is the guy that runs it, former investigative journalist. And he's got him commenting on the Cooper articles right there. Bob, he goes by Airborne Bob. He's commenting on his articles there. So he's very, he's very much the sociopath. He loves the attention he's getting. He claims he's trying, to, he's trying desperately to find an attorney. But you know what? They've gotten a look at the book. And they don't want to challenge those endnotes. That's what's going on. I, I, look, I'm, I, I hope he comes. I have three attorneys on our cold case team that are all pro bono waiting to make history with him in a depot. That's what's going to happen. Kind of like what happened to OJ. Never mind. <laughs> is this a question or a... <laughs> no, this is a, this is a question. Tom, you have to tell the story. Maybe not a question. You have to tell the story of the heart transplant when you were still oh, at yeah. uh, Channel 2 so many years ago. But it, I use it when I teach and whenever I talk Thanks, to Bill. someone, a student, it's the most incredible catch just listening, the idea of listening to what someone tells you created a story that involved uh, two major markets in the United States. Yeah, it may bring a cry. Uh, I developed a beat check of every control tower, every, assign uh, every police department, every county sheriff. Every night we did the beat check, it was 24 numbers, speed dial. It was one of the first speed dials in 1984. And boom, they'd get a call and we'd talk about our families and so forth. And then they just would call me. They, You're gonna be calling me in an hour anyway, I might as well tell you. And it got to the point where I could use the, the helicopter airports, uh, the heliports. I would call LAPD and say, hey, we just have a two-car pileup in a town. There's two injured. Do you have an airship up? Thanks, Tom. Where is it? Boom, 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 boom. And that's how we worked. Uh, we'd be collaborative in the point. Well, this is what happened. I had a paramedic at uh, LA City a fire department call me and said, Tom, we're, trans we're moving a heart. I said, this is 1983. And we're going, what's, what's moving a heart mean? He said, we literally are transferring a heart from a patient to another. Well, this is before anybody chased the choppers or anybody followed donors. Donors was considered in 1983 icky. You don't put up transferring body parts. It's, you know, that's private. Almost like domestic shootings used to be private. <laughs> <laughs> you remember all that's domestic, Ray Witt used to say. We're not doing gr uh, domestic. You'd be good at hard copy, Michael. <laughs> well, bottom line is he called and he said, no, they're moving a heart. And uh, we're flying in a Learjet with doctors from Stanford. They're going to be in their masks. They're landing at the airport. And, uh, and you guys should cover it. I think there's something here. And I said, damn well is there, there is something here. And I said, and he talked about the difficulty of trying to get people to volunteer body parts for when a loved one passes for others. And I heard that, and I walked up to my uh, executive at the time, Mark, I can't remember the, the EP at the time, uh, and I said, look, I think this is a positive story people can learn from. You've got a family. He's one of 13 kids. He's hit by a drunk. He ran for, at 22, he ran for mayor of Simi Valley. He's at UCLA, and he gets hit by a drunk and killed. And his family, who are very strict Christians, broke away from their church because they didn't want to, uh, they didn't allow body parts to be shared, this church. 
And they broke away and they said, no, we're going we're gonna to donate his body parts. And so they're telling me this story. And so I said, i got to call the family. I don't know what I'm going to say, but I've always learned. My dad said, when you don't know what you're going to say, that's how you start it. And I did. Well, before I did, I had to get permission from my editor. And my executive producer said, no, that's gross. And he goes off to dinner. And I'm sitting there waiting. And I said, come on, God, do something. He's in the middle of his meal, and he puts his fork down. He runs back and says, set it up. Lester Holt was the reporter. And I said, send Lester. And I said, well, well, do we have permission? Just go. I'll get it. So I called into the emergency room, and I got the dad on the phone. And I said, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable calling you. I'm the son of a physician. I know the sensitivities here. But I think people can learn from this. I really, really do. My first talk actually was with the head nurse. And she said, OK, I'll get him. Puts him on. I gave the same pitch. And the dad said, OK, bring him in. So we sent in the camera crew. And uh, the most compelling statement the dad said, I remember on that tape, do you have the tape? I'll make you a copy. I still have it. And he said, uh, you, you know, when your son's in a situation like this and he's brain dead, you can't call in a hitman from Chicago to finish it. It's got to be daddy. And whew, just heavy. But the most emotional moment was after talking to various members of the family is that here the doctors, or here's the family leaving the emergency room. They've harvested the parts for eyes and all sorts of body parts and the heart. And the family is hugging on the way out, and they're resolved, the other 12 kids. And suddenly outrun the doctors to the Learjet, parked at the runway here at Van Nuys Airport where the family is. And they're in their gowns, and they've got their masks on still. And uh, uh, what do they have the heart in? It's in one of the. Red and, white beer, red and white beer coolers. And they're running down, and suddenly the family just becomes a cheerleader section. Go, Daddy. Go, go Johnny. Go. They and the Yeah, they're just, they're, it was just a heartbreaking moment. But we got, we got like, somebody said 800 letters in the next few months to Channel 2. And the one that I saved was a woman who said, you know, I'm angry that my doctor didn't have the guts to ask if I, my son could have saved somebody. And the, the ultimate part of the story was that we were able to find the uh, recipient yes. in the Bay Area. Right. And we had the, the, uh, the same people that took the heart into the plane. They were running into the, the operating room in yes. the Bay Area. Yes, and we had the eyes delivered to a man in Florida, and that was tracked. It was the first time news had covered uh, that we could find around the country that covered a donor chase. And of course, the rest is history with the donors. <laughs> They're followed every day. But um, I truly believe that sometimes God's hit, God hits people on the head, and that was one of the times that he hit me to push it. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, Mr. Graywood. Hi. I'm Mike Graywood, and I was the assignment editor at, uh, on this story that uh, Tom just uh, told. Uh, while he was working one side, they were also, we were trying to get tape in, and we barely made the lead story. Mm -hmm. When we started to get some of the tape from Lester Holt uh, on this, and everybody was compassionate about it. They started feeding in the tape. Jess Marlowe was standing back at a monitor, Connie Chung, and tears were coming down in their eyes. Yeah, everybody was a crying. A lot of people. And it was a tremendous story. And, I, and it, it's factual. It's one of these things that happens at the last minute. You take a chance, and you come up with a dynamite uh, story for, for a show or a production. And uh, Tom is one of the best researchers that I've worked with Thank over you, the years. And I was Thank on you. the desk over there for about four years. And uh, prior to that, I was in radio. But uh, before I left and that, Tom is the only man on uh, my going away had, uh, was playing jokes on me. <laughs> and. I was getting phone calls from a number of people, <laughs> one of whom was a feminist uh, attorney 
Her first name is Gloria, her last name is Allrad. And he got a hold of her and had her call me and say, good luck on your new job. Anyway, I just wanted to add that. And who was the talk show host who was the precursor to Springer in Orange County? Larry? Wally George. Wally George. Mike absolutely hated him, and I tracked down Wally for his birthday. I said, Molly, you know, Wally, you know what would make his, his day? Wish him a happy birthday and use your tagline. So I said, Mike, you got a call, and he's going, oh, who do you have this time? And he goes, Mike, this is, this is Wally George. You're an idiot on your birthday. <laughs> hey, a big round of applause for both Toms, please. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you both very, very much. They're thank both you. here. The books are for sale in the back of the room for 15 bucks. I haven't read the book yet. I'm sure it's a great read. The history documentary was most interesting. Thank I, you so I want to add, you guys know how lucky you are to have a saint like this in this community. And I'm telling you, this, this is... As, as we all worry about our bodies, it's wonderful to see our brains still strong, and that's to Bob. Thanks to Bob.